Hey gang, it's Joe Bay Plant. Today we're wrapping up the wine series. That's right, after about a year or so, I've kind of just ran out of stuff to talk about with wine. Um, actually, at the end of the video, I'll kind of go into what's coming up next, but I thought today to wrap up, I would go over wine service and other various items, uh, opening a bottle of wine, storing wine, what have you. Just kind of wine knickknacks, I guess, best way to put it. Uh, first, I want to start off with serving temperature. What's the proper temperature to serve wine? And it kind of depends. Sparkling wines, we're going to look at between 40 and 45 degrees. White wines, 45 to 50 degrees. And red wines, we're looking at roughly 50 to 60. Um, one thing you may notice about this range of temperatures is that we're somewhere between refrigerator temperature and room temperature. And that's kind of where you want to go when storing wines. Uh, if you had a proper wine cabinet, wine cellar, one of these little mini wine fridges that are out there. Um, 52 degrees is about a perfect point that would cover champagne, red wine, white, you know, all the wine types. Um, most people, however, do not have a wine cabinet, so storing at room temperature will be fine. Um, you want to avoid big swings in temperatures. You don't want to leave bottles near windows where they get direct sunlight, uh, especially white wine bottles because like beer, a clear bottle that sun, sunlight or direct light in, and that will damage the product. Um, also, too, when storing at room temperature, you want to make sure you don't have your bottle sideways because you want to keep that cork moist. Um, if it dries out, it could end up oxidizing the wine or damaging that wine, and we don't want to do that. Um, if you store at room temperature, but you want to serve let's say you have a dinner party at night if you'll throw that white wine in the fridge midday you'll be just fine on temperature same thing with the champagnes uh red wine i'm gonna say a lot of people just drink red wine pretty much at room temperature anyway uh if you wanted to maybe throw it in the fridge 15 30 minutes or something before serving just to cool it off just a little bit and that's all you're really looking for you're not looking to chill it um Just, uh, and again, consistency in temperatures, maintaining consistent temperatures is important. A uh, question I get every once in a while is, drinking an old wine okay? When I mean an old wine, I mean a wine that's 10, 15, 20 plus years old. Uh, 2003, a 1997, whatever vintage. And the answer is yes. Wines, as long as that cork is maintained in the foil and it's been kept at a constant temperature, Wines can stay fresh and drinkable for years and years and years. Uh, some wines tend to do better than others. Wines with a high alcohol content or high acidity tend to age better, tend to hold up to the long time, you know, in storage. Um, and again, the cork, again, make sure that bottle has been taken care of. Um, your cheaper wines that you buy at stores, your local grocery stores. Whites, you want to drink within about six months. Reds, you'll have up to a couple of years. Again, bigger bodied, higher alcohol. Uh, reds tend to do a little bit better. Uh, another question I get, hey, I've opened a bottle of wine. How long is it good for? Uh, the short answer to that is a um, couple of days to up to a week. It depends on the wine. It also depends on how you're taking care of it. Uh, if you don't throw that cork back into the wine after, let's say, you drink half a bottle at dinner and you want to save it, if you don't throw the cork back in, within a day or two, that wine's going to oxidize. If you just throw the cork back in, again, you have two to three days. Um, if you have a proper wine stopper that makes an airtight seal, you might get another day or so out of it. Um, there, are other pro there are products out there like a wine vacuum. You'll put that on top. You'll pump. Or and uh, you'll suck the air out and it's the air, once that air gets in that bottle, it starts oxidizing that wine. And so if you could pump that air out and then seal it airtight like they have with those pumps, that'll get you a few more days, a couple more days out of it. And then finally, what is a product that's out now, something called a Coravin, that you will sit on top of the wine bottle and it'll take a needle and it'll pierce, it'll pierce your foil through all the way through the cork, it's a, it's a longer needle, into the bottle itself where you'll pour out a half glass or something like that 
and then to fill that spot, that open spot suited with air like you would open it, it will shoot, an, I believe it's argon gas in there, and that gas will maintain the wine. It won't get any oxygen in there so that wine won't start to deteriorate or oxidize. So I could pour a glass today, six months later pour another glass, another six months later pour another glass, and then two years from now finish that, and all, all of those glasses will taste the same. It will maintain quality. And so if you have a real high-end wine, which is what I encourage, uh, if you wanted that product, that's what I encourage for higher-end wines that you might just want to, you know, sip a half a glass just for special occasions or whatever. Um, like I said, that, because of that gas it injects in, it will maintain quality. Uh, any of these products I talk about, I'm going to leave links down below if you're interested in them or want to kind of up your wine experience at home. Uh, next, I want to talk about decanting. Uh, decant, D-E-C-A-N-T. Um, I've mentioned it in one or two videos, and I get a lot of people, what's decanting, whatever. Basically, the best way to put it is, in especially older bottles of wine that have been sitting around a while, you're going to have things settle to the bottom. Solids. It's not yeast or anything per se. It's just, even though this bottle's done fermenting, there's still chemical processes going on, and sometimes you just have stuff fall out. And what you'll want to do, and what they'll do, like at a nice steakhouse or whatever, is they'll take a classic bottle of old wine, and they'll pour into a decanting container, but they'll pour it carefully to leave that sediment on the bottom. Um, a good way to think about it is, if you're taking something out, if we're homebrewing, we're taking something out of the primary fermenter, putting it in the secondary fermenter. We just don't dump it out. We'll... We'll siphon it off in a way where we'll leave that sediment in the bottom of the first one, and then we have a clearer liquid with less physical floaties, what have you, in there. And that's what we're striving for when we decant wine. Um, next is glassware. Uh, there's all kinds of wine glassware. There's the classic Bordeaux glasses, burgundy glasses. You have champagne glasses, port glasses. Um, you can go as far and extreme as you like. I generally suggest starting off with a simple wine glass. When I say simple wine glass, you want something stemmed because you don't necessarily want to hold it with your hand. Again, you'll increase temperatures, you know, the, the heat coming off your hand. You want to avoid that. So you want something stemware. You want something a little kind of bulbous on the bottom, kind of narrows on the top, but a wide enough opening where you can get your nose in, into it. It's that sensory experience, the smell of the wine along with the taste of the wine that kind of brings a total wine experience. You want something big enough where you can get your nose in there and really enjoy it. Uh, I also encourage you to go with clear wine glasses. Um, a, make sure you don't get either a piece of cork in, in there or a flyer or, you know, so you kind of see your wine. Also, too, the visual aspect of the wine uh, can kind of tell you a lot about the wine. Um, sometimes in certain red wines, along the edge of the wine, you'll see, sometimes you might see a brownish tint, and that could be the wine's oxidizing, and, and if only you can only do that if you're seeing it through a clear glass. Um, also, again, the color of certain white wines tells you a little more of a story, uh, what have you, uh, so stick with clear glasses. Uh, washing wine glasses, I suggest hand washing, especially stemware. You throw it in a dishwasher, you're probably going to end up banging it, chipping it, cracking it. Hand wash your stemware. Also, hand dry your stemware, stemware with a lint-free towel. Uh, this is good for a couple of reasons. A, gets all the water off, looks nice, and those lipstick stains. Um, even in a commercial sitting, like I, you know, at a big bar that I work at with a commercial dishwasher, we still don't get the lipstick off the time. It's when I hand polish it that we take care of that lipstick. So that's uh, something you want to do. When storing wine glasses, don't store them down like that. Store them up. If you have hand dried with a lint towel, you're not worried about water needing to drip water out. And if you leave it down like that, a lot of times that moisture will stay and you'll get kind of a mussiness, funkiness. You know, you could grow something, you know, funky with that moisture content. Leave it up, let it dry out. Um, next, I want to briefly go over champagne. I did a video over champagne, sparkling wine. I opened a bottle there. Just kind of want to go over the basics here. I don't have a champagne bottle, but we'll use our imaginary champagne bottle. The first thing you would do when opening champagne is you would take your handy-dandy wine opener, and a good one will always have some kind of knife, and you will 
want to cut along the bottom of the cage, cut that foil along the bottom of the cage, unwrap the foil. After you unwrap the foil, be sure to keep your hand on top of that. That bottle of champagne is pressurized and that cork wants out. There's a lot of pressure behind it, so keep your hand on that. Then you'll twist that, you'll have the little twist deal, and six, if you haven't heard, it's six twists. It'll always be six twists. You twist, but keep your hand on that cage. Don't and don't remove the cage once you're done. Loosen that cage up, but leave it on. Again, anything can set that cork off, and it's ready to blow. And it seems like a fun thing to shoot a cork, but it's under a lot of pressure, and it can hurt somebody. When you're ready to open, keep your hand on the cage. You can use a towel if you want also, but keep your hand on the cage. And instead of twisting the cork, you don't want to do that because it's easy to snap a cork off. And then... Opening a bottle of champagne is tricky enough, but then with a broke cork inside, it becomes real tough. You'll want to hold that cork and then twist with the other hand and uh, open that way. While you're opening, if it's already starting to splooge, spit out, or whatever, you most likely haven't had that champagne at the proper temperature. It's possibly got warm. Now, in a club where you know it's already hot in there anyway and you're shooting it off or whatever, not that big a deal, but a nice dinner party, you don't want that uh, shooting off. After you open, you're ready to pour. You want to pour in a steady stream, and you want to pour about half a glass. You don't want to get aggressive with the pour and have that foam up and then have to wait for it to settle down before you pour the rest. Nice, slow pour, about half a glass. Let's say we had four people here. I would pour four half glasses and then put my champagne, sparkling wine, back in the ice bucket or whatever. I was keeping it, but you again want to keep it chilled. Um, and that that's just some basics with champagne. Uh, wine, we're going to do table wine now. And we're going to cut, the first thing we're going to do, opening wine, is we're going to cut the foil. Um, and this is obviously dependent, we're obviously dealing with wine with cork, and not, you know, screw cap or whatever. Two schools of thought. Some say cut this lower lip, some say cut the upper lip. That's up to you. I'm going on this one, cut the upper, uh, around the upper lip. We're going to cut all the way around. And then we're going to peel off. You want to make sure you all the way peeled around. Um, you could if you want to. Make sure we've got none of that around the lip because you don't want anything falling in. To properly uh, open all the wine, you want to take your corkscrew and come in at kind of an angle. Um, these corkscrews are, the screw itself is at a slight angle, but you want to be able to tack it down the center of that cork. You don't want to come off the side, so you kind of come off at a little bit of an angle. And then you'll slowly screw in. Now you don't want to go all the way up top of the screw because you don't want to go all the way through that cork. If you go through all the way to the cork, you end up punching some cork in the wine, and we want to avoid that. But you do want to get deep, just not too deep. Get up to where you're starting about that last screw. And I like these double hinged cork screws because if I had to go all the way up here to get this first one, it's kind of tough. It's a tough angle. And getting that first quarter half inch of that cork started is the toughest part. And this hinge allows you to get a better angle, better physics behind it. So, all right, so we, we got her started. We got that first little bit. And then after we get that up, then we can come with that other hinge and then work our way through and you want to make sure you're pulling straight up because again the last thing we want is to snap a cork um so we have her open and if we were doing proper wine service in let's say a steakhouse or whatever you would serve the host whoever the host of the party is you would serve them a sample just Something like that. And when you're pouring, what's called, uh, you want to cut the pour. Because especially like red wine, 
you don't want that red wine getting on someone's white shirt, white dress, white tablecloth. And that's why you always want to keep a towel, napkin, whatever ready to go when you serve. That's another suggestion. Again, red wine's tough to get out, so you want to avoid that. Um, after the, the uh, host is all right, Start with the ladies and then work your way around the table, finishing off with that host. Um, what if you break a cork? That's another question. And I've cut a cork just to kind of show. Let's say we snapped off top quarter, third of a cork. Um, all is not lost. Um, what I suggest is using the corkscrew, you'll want to go into the deeper part of that cork. You want to attack from at kind of an angle, go in that deeper part. You don't want to go all the way through. Uh, again, you don't want to puncture or put cork in that wine. You just want to go deep enough. And remember, we've also got less surface area we're combating with the lip of that bottle. So it should take a little less force. But get as deep as you can, and then you'll pull out. Um, if that cork has been cracked, if you, let's say, took off four-fifths or three-quarters and only have a little bit of that cork left, sometimes you might have to just push her through and into that wine. Or, again, if that cork is deteriorated to such a point, it may just crumble and fall into the wine. But the wine can still be saved. That doesn't necessarily mean the wine's bad. Um, if that happened, we would have to decant. And I suggest, again, uh, going through the coffee filter, especially if the cork is deteriorated at that point. If the cork is deteriorated at that point, be sure to smell that wine. Check that wine out because there's a good chance that wine might have oxidized or something has got into there. Also, to talk about something you may have seen in movies or TV where they take a cork, you know, the guy will sniff the cork or whatever. That's kind of a misnomer. Um, in an old wine, you would want to check the cork because sometimes you'll see a fungus or a mold on the bottom. That will tell you something. And if that cork has deteriorated, again, that wine might have got oxidized. So you might want to give a quick inspection, but you're not going to want to sniff it or let everybody sniff it. That's, that's a, little bit of a, a little bit of silliness. Um, again, if that cork is broke or, you know, falls apart going and you smell the wine, sometimes wines are just off. Uh, we're dealing with a natural product that goes in a bottle that is protected by cork, which is another natural product. And they bottle millions of bottles of wine per year. The laws of math just say sometimes something's going to go wrong. Um, the wine, there might have been, you know, that bottle might not have been sanitized perfect. But just temperature went wrong. That cork deteriorated. Sometimes you're going to get a bad bottle of wine. It just happens. Throw it away. Let it go. I know it stinks, especially if you put a lot of money into a bottle of a rare vintage but that's going to happen sometimes, so just be prepared uh, for that. Finally, uh, we're going to drink a little bit of wine. The wine we have tonight is the Alamos Red Blend from Mendoza, Argentina. It comes in at 30% alcohol by volume. It's a 2017. Let me uh, pour a little bit more for myself. Um, it's a blend Malbec, Barnado, and Tempranillo. Get on the nose. Nice fruit, I get a little spice, maybe a little tobacco, let's give her a try. Oh my gosh, that's nice. I really do love the Argent, of all the wines we drink, however, I really like the Argentine, Chilean, Spanish heritage wines. Um, I think they got a nice amount of fruit. But they've got some complexity, some spice, enough acidity. Um, I just, out of all those wines, I just think I appreciate those the most. And this is a, again, this has all these qualities. Enough fruit, approachability, but there's complexity, depth, uh, Drink a uh, very drinkable wine, though not too much body or viscosity. Good wine. Real quick, um, go over what's coming up. 
Next video will be, we're going to start a series on alcoholic spirits. I'm going to take you through the world of vodka, gin, rum, scotch, tequila, what have you. And that's going to lead us to then a regular series on cocktails. I'm a professional bartender. I haven't done a lot of cocktails on this channel. So I thought I'd take you through the world of spirits and basically let you, you know, teach you on what we're going to work with. And then after we're through the spirit series, it'll probably take a few months, we're going to start making cocktails. I'm going to show you how to make some of my favorite cocktails, some of the most popular cocktails, and how some of the cocktails will help you learn other cocktails. So that will be coming up. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.